Hello dear ones, today we're going to be exploring the psychology of Cersei Lannister and her narcissistic traits, her narcissistic uh, behaviour that informs so much of her relationships, it informs her relationships, her behaviours, her actions and also shapes her character arc throughout the series in Game of Thrones. We're going to examine what her motivating forces are, what are the prime movers that trigger her decisions and her actions. Moreover, we'll be identifying with Cersei what her vulnerabilities are, what are those pain points that emotionally set her off, that trigger her emotionally. Within this, we'll be unpacking her psyche through the prism, through the theme that encapsulates so many of her traits and marks so much of her disinhibited egocentrism and her manipulation. And that is the lens and the theme of the dark triad. This is a psychological term that describes the combination of narcissism, psychopathy and Machiavellianism. So narcissism, just a quick breakdown, is an excessive gratification of the ego and its self-vanity. Psychopathy is an impaired empathy, so struggling to um, relate to people and emotionally connect with people and uh, feel what they're feeling and understand their point of view. And Machiavellianism is a is a manipulation, a manipulative, disinhibited uh, uh, trait. So those three are going to serve as the prism through which we understand the shape of her arc and how she develops as a character, her psyche. In terms of the structure of understanding Cersei Lannister, we'll be unlocking her psyche through three key themes. The first being her upbringing, Cersei's upbringing, and how she felt when she was growing up, overlooked and overshadowed. And this is so key. This, I feel, really marks so much of the behaviour that follows in her life, in her adulthood. The second thing that we'll be exploring is her children, Cersei Lannister's children. We'll be exploring this in two parts. Firstly, how her identity merges with that of her children. So her children become absorbed into part of her identity. They are extensions of herself. And the second aspect we'll be exploring within that theme is the idea that she relives so much of her trauma, so many of her traumas through her children. They represent different aspects of her trauma that she's experienced in her life. And the third and final aspect that we'll be exploring is how Cersei establishes dominance with her enemies and with her allies. And equally important, I think, is we are going to be touching on the fact that Cersei establishes dominance as a way to feel empowered and as a way to as a way for her to regulate her equilibrium. It's a way for her to establish her baseline of feeling centered. That is a way for her if she's feeling out of control and disempowered. Through establishing dominance over other characters, she's able to regulate her, regulate her equilibrium. So we'll be exploring that as well. Now, the first thing that we'll be exploring is Cersei's upbringing. And we'll be placing particular emphasis on the way that she is overlooked and overshadowed as a child. So Cersei is the firstborn to a powerful house, the Lannister house. She is capable, she's intelligent, and she is elitist. She's inherited Tywin's elitism and Tywin's obsession with strengthening the Lannister house so her and heading the Lannister house so her identity is very much rooted in the house 
the house serves as an extension of her power and of her identity. So given that, Cersei cannot understand the differentiation between her and Jamie, her twin. Cersei's identity and sense of self is rooted in the power of the house and also in Jamie. Because they are twins, uh, there is a oneness there that they share emotionally and also through identity, through, through self-identity. So Jamie supersedes her because of his gender. He's a male and she's a female. And Cersei is overshadowed by Jamie. Jamie overshadows her. This merged identity with Jamie is therefore very jarring for her because he's being treated differently to her. He's being treated better. He would inherit uh, the Lannister house, the Lannister name. He will, he has more power than she does because of gender, because of his gender. So this is very jarring for her when others distinguish and discriminate against her. So Jamie is more significant. Jamie's more important than Cersei is. And he will inherit the house, he will perpetuate the legacy, he will, um, he will fight, he'll be able to battle. And so Cersei becomes a bargaining chip, essentially, because of her gender, because she is female. She has become a possession. She is automatically a possession. And she is used as a tool to further alliances and to trade. She's to horse trade with, as it were. And this medium of political exchange is a way to further the political schemes of her father and to strengthen certain bonds with certain houses. So this is something where she is clearly a pawn. She is a piece in a chess game. Jamie, on the other hand, is far more empowered. He has more autonomy. She doesn't. Obviously, we must consider that Jamie has autonomy. However, he is expected to marry, produce heirs, inherit the family name, and uh, uh, become the head of the Lannister household. So what does this provoke within her, given this context, what does this provoke within her? It provokes within her a resentment and a bitterness towards her father, towards Tywin, and a need to assert her power. She feels vulnerable and she feels disempowered as a child. And so this engenders a psychological pattern. And the psychological pattern is this. She feels vulnerable, disempowered, resentful, and desperate. She is desperate to feel powerful. She's desperate to feel like she is a political player, like she is a main, a major player. And so this becomes a massive motivator for her. This becomes a, pr a prime mover in her decision-making and her behavior. So another aspect that we'll be exploring in her childhood is her relationship with Tyrion. Tyrion, this is a very, very complicated one. Tyrion represents something grotesque to Cersei. To her, he stole her mother. He stole her maternal figure. He is malformed. He is grotesque to her. And so because he robbed Cersei of her maternal figure, of her mother, she abuses Tyrion to empower herself, to, to suppress the pain, to satiate the pain. She channels her pain through abusing him. An example of this is when the Martells came to visit and she apparently pinched Tyrion's nether regions when he was a baby to make him cry, to hurt him. This is a very, very disturbing example of how she, of the rage she feels within herself and how she is directing that rage. She is channeling her rage uh, onto Tyrion. So even though eventually she comes to begrudgingly respect him, she is frustrated um, that he is uh, so capable and intelligent, uh, she will always 
he will always represent to her a grotesque and malformed person that robbed her, that stole her mother from her. A third aspect within her upbringing that we'll touch base on as well is Maggie's prophecy. So Cersei has a prophecy given to her as a child and the prophecy says that she'll be cast down by a younger, more beautiful queen, that her children will die before her. And this, obviously there are other aspects to the prophecy as well, the three, there were three uh, questions that she asked and that she answered, but th those two to me stood out the most in terms of her psychology. This promotes and reinforces Cersei's vulnerability and her weak points, her pain points. These trigger her need to impose dominance on others and to abuse others. This is to empower herself, to establish dominance. Because she has this in the back of her mind and her subconscious mind, she'll be cast down by someone more beautiful and younger than her, a younger queen and more beautiful queen. That is a, there is a paranoia there on a subconscious level. And the fact that her children will die before her, this puts her in a vulnerable position from the off. So her narcissism and her, her psychopathy comes from a place of vulnerability. She feels deeply vulnerable. And this, therefore, this abuse that she enacts on others, this, this narcissism stems from a weakness, stems from the feeling of, of being powerless and feeling disempowered. So it's a way for her to empower herself. And Maggie's prophecy is part of that. Maggie's prophecy is part of something that she has absorbed into her psyche uh, and therefore serves as a pain point, as a trigger point in her behaviour in the future. A second theme that we'll be unpicking in Cersei's psychological arc is her relationship with her children and what her children represent to her. So this is an example, her relationship with her children is an example of merging one's identity with another person, with another being. And she amplifies her own sense of self and her own identity through her children. They are extensions of her own identity, of herself. And because of this extension of identity, because of this merged identity with her children, and also because of Maggie's prophecy that they would die before her, her children children's death would be for her own. She feels particularly vulnerable, and this is an anxiety point for her, a pain point for her, as I said earlier. Her children are a pain point for her and a vulnerability for her. And because of this, Cersei is obsessed with controlling them. She's obsessed with shaping their life, and to her it is a form of protection. She's looking to preserve them. And they serve as a tactile embodiment of self, of herself. And so to her, they are the ultimate vulnerability in her life. They are a trigger point, they're an emotional trigger point for her. And another interesting aspect in exploring her children is I believe that her children are a form of rebellion, a form of rebellion against Robert and by extension her father. I believe they personify a defiance and an opposition to Robert and to Tywin. The reason I say this is because she was forced into an arranged marriage, ultimately with Robert, and Although her first child who died, who passed away, was Robert's, her three children that survived are Jamie's. So they're Jamie's children. And so to me, that is the ultimate form of rebellion. It is the ultimate two fingers up to her father and to Robert, who is not an attentive husband, who does not uh, satisfy her or give her what she needs emotionally. So this is a form of dissent and it is a wonderful secret that she harbours that those children aren't even 
legitimate. They aren't even Roberts. And so it is a real finger up. It is a real two fingers up to her father and to Robert. And so, again, from a point of vulnerability, she was disempowered when she had an arranged marriage. She was disempowered when she was uh, shipped off to Robert. And this is a form of empowerment. This is a form of her establishing dominance through having children from, through having Jamie's children. This is a way for her to claim autonomy and self-governance over her life. She empowers herself through this act of resistance with Jamie, through this act of intimacy with Jamie. Jamie also serves to meet two profound needs in her. Those are, again, as with her children, they are an amplification of herself. They, he serves as an extension of her own identity because they are twins, they are so similar. And uh, they share this taboo secret. Another aspect, another need that she, that is met through Jamie, is this need to defy and rebel against her father. Jamie is the golden child and Cersei has done the ultimate act of defiance to her father, which is she has a control over Jamie. So it's a form of her getting control over her father. It is a way for her to empower herself over her father when her father, in her mind, seeks to disempower her. Now Cersei splinters into two aspects in her mind. She splinters into self and not self. Me and not me. So her children, they're self, they are her. Jamie is self. Enemies, not self. That is how she uh, decompartmentalizes uh, enemies, allies, family, etc. So Cersei loves herself, she gratifies herself and Jamie. So Jamie encapsulates that. Jamie encapsulates the love of self and the gratification of self. When she is with Jamie intimately, it is almost like a self-soothing act because Jamie represents herself. <laughs> Jamie represents a part of herself. So mentally, so the mentality of shunning others and this disinhibited egocentrism, which has been fostered by her father's scheming coldness and his uh, rigid view of uh, perpetuating the house. This extends to the Lannister bloodline over the Baratheon bloodline. This extends to the hereditary nature of Cersei's children. This is a way for Cersei to take something from Tywin, to rob Tywin of something. He is so powerful and he wields a power over her life. This is an opportunity for her to really undermine him and undercut him. She is, she feels that he stole something from her. And so because he stole her autonomy from her, that's what she feels. He stole my autonomy from me. She is now stealing something from him, which is the perpetuation of the Lannister and the Baratheon uh, alliance. So she wields a power over Tywin and Robert that is completely secret, that is unbeknownst to them. So this is something that she is harbouring within herself that is a satisfying uh, way for her to reclaim her autonomy and to undercut two men in her life that uh, wield power over her. Now, let's, let's delve into each child individually. Joffrey. What does Joffrey represent to her psychologically? Joffrey is a reliving of the trauma and the disrespect and the dismissal that she faced as a child and that she faces with Robert. She's overlooked by Robert. She's been dismissed 
and overlooked as a child because Jamie is the golden child. She is not the one to head the Lannister house. And so Joffrey's behaviour to her is very much in keeping with what she has experienced through her father and through Robert. The disrespect, the dismissal, being overlooked, being, being diminished. That is something she experienced with the Joffrey. So that is a reliving of that trauma, the trauma of, uh, of the two most powerful men in her life, Robert and Tywin. Marcella also represents a trauma in her life, which is the arranged marriage aspect of her life. This was obviously a mechanism, it's a mechanism for house alliances, um, having uh, arranged marriages between houses. And this reliving of Marcella's trauma is, represents a stripping away of the autonomy that I spoke about earlier. The autonomy that she, that was taken away from her, that was robbed from her by her father, by Tywin. So that's the trauma that she represents, that Marcella represents, which is why she feels it so keenly when Marcella is shipped off to Dawn. That is something that's very, very painful for her and very uh, raw for her to experience. And the kind of trauma that Tommen, Tommen represents the trauma of the prophecy, of Maggie's prophecy. He is, to Cersei, disloyal and he betrays her because he is so in love with Marjorie and because he becomes Marjorie's. To Cersei, as I said before, there is a real uh, uh, splintering in Cersei's mindset and her mentality of self or not self. And so Tommen has chosen, has gone, has shifted from self to not self because he has now allied himself with Marjorie, who to her is thinking back to Marjorie's uh, to Maggie's prophecy, a younger and more beautiful queen who will cast her down. So she thinks that is tying into uh, she thinks that is linked to Marjorie. So Tommen is disloyal, he's betrayed her, and he initially represents a part of her. He initially represents her, herself and her identity. Then he becomes not her. He starts off as her, then becomes not her. And the betrayal is simply that he marries someone and falls in love with someone and uh, wants to, is completely besotted by her and she is his world. Cersei isn't his world anymore. She can't control him in the way that Marjorie can. Marjorie can manipulate and control in the most nuanced, subtle, refined way. It is masterful to watch. And Cersei is no longer able to control him. So Tommen has betrayed her in her mind. And Cersei, importantly, has been conditioned by her father in her upbringing to strengthen the house and to shun others to win. That has been the mentality. The mentality that Tywin has raised them on is the winning mentality, the winner's mentality. So for Cersei, when she sees Marjorie as a real genuine threat and when Marjorie taps into this paranoia that she has from the prophecy in her subconscious mind uh, to Cersei, she is desperate therefore to establish dominance over her and to claw back some semblance of control, some semblance of autonomy. So the third thing that we are outlining in Cersei's psychology is what are her motivating forces? What is her prime mover? To me, I feel the motivating force behind Cersei Lannister and her decisions is her need to establish dominance over others, to stop feeling, so she doesn't feel vulnerable, establishing dominance over her enemies, over her allies, over family even. Tywin, her father, fostered a mentality of win by any means necessary. So as a child, she's been raised on that mentality. She's been raised on that um, attitude. And an example of this, an example of win by any means necessary. This example of winning by any means necessary has almost become even more twisted in her mind where she applies it to 
allies, family, as well as enemies. So she's broadened that attitude. She's broadened that mentality. An example of this is with Sansa's direwolf lady. She demands punishment. And so Sansa's direwolf lady is killed because of this. Even though Sansa's direwolf had nothing to do with the incident where Joffrey's arm was bitten, uh, Cersei decides, even though the Starks are allies and Sansa at the time was supposed to be betrothed to uh, Joffrey, that was the plan, that was the, um, that was the alliance that was established between the two houses. Cersei doesn't care. She wants to establish dominance in the situation and she does so through punishing Lady, which punishes Sansa, which in turn establishes her dominance over Robert, over, over this isolated, in, over this instant. That was a very satisfying, gratifying, uh, this is emotionally gratifying for her, this is emotionally satisfying for her to do this. Another example is when King's Landing is being besieged and she does her utmost to intimidate Sansa and to provoke her. She wants to frighten her and scare her about the nature of war and battle and uh, being intimate with men. She's trying her utmost to provoke her and to intimidate her. And this abuse and this intimidation is an addiction. It's an addiction for Cersei and it satisfies her and regulates her equilibrium and regulates her baseline in a way that makes her feel empowered and stable and steady and centered. So this is a very real addiction for her. For her enemies, for her enemies, that's her allies, for her enemies, the Lannister house is fundamental to her identity. And this veneer of power and dominance is so crucial to her sense of self so besting others and destroying your enemies is a way of strengthening that sense of self, that sense of self through strengthening the house, you're strengthening your own identity, your own sense of self. So she doesn't just look to undercut and undermine her enemies, she looks to quash them and destroy them. This is something that's very empowering for her and very satisfying for her. And this is a way to regulate those feelings of vulnerability, that feeling of uh, feeling disempowered as a child, the childhood trauma that she experiences. This is a way to alleviate those pain points. She felt such, such trauma as a child. And so this is a way for her to assuage this and stop at it and a way to feel invulnerable when she feels so vulnerable. And this is the only way she knows how to manage those feelings. She cannot confront that vulnerability, the vulnerability of uh, the trauma of being overlooked uh, by her family, by her father, the trauma of being um, uh, traded off as a tool for political uh, alliances, the, the trauma of losing her mother, losing her maternal figure, the trauma of Maggie's prophecy. So of the paranoia that that festered within her. So these are traumas that she cannot, she has not confronted. And so this is a way for her to manage that feeling of vulnerability and those pain points, those anxiety points. Now, an example of her destroying her enemies, an obvious one is the Sept. She blows up the Sept with a lot of her enemies in there. This is a classic example of the Dark Triad that we referred to earlier, that we referenced earlier. This is an example of psychopathy, completely impaired empathy, Machiavellianism, her manipulation, her scheming, her coldness, and her narcissism. So in this situation, she is completely disconnected from the reality of the event, and she's indifferent. All she has done is pure manipulate, this is pure manipulation, and implementing a plan and a scheme that she has created, she's constructed. This is so gratifying for her ego. This is massively satisfying for her ego. And the reason why it is, the reason why she has an impaired empathy with all of those within the sept is because they are not her. They are not her. They represent not her, 
so she's okay to destroy them and to uh, quash so many of her enemies in one blow. And the reason that this egocentrism uh, damages her is because Tommen commits suicide from this incident. He loses Marjorie. Now for her, she has in her subconscious mind the paranoia that Marjorie is this beautiful younger queen that will usurp her, that will cast her down. To her, Marjorie has taken Tommen from her. This is a way for her to reclaim Tommen from Marjorie through blowing up the sept. And moreover, because she did not consider Tommen, she did not consider that he would commit suicide, that this would be so emotionally devastating for him that he would not be able to live without Marjorie. Marjorie is the absolute um, centre of his world. And Cersei is not anymore. Cersei used to be able to control Tommen and Marjorie, in a far more refined, nuanced, subtle way, is able to manipulate Tommen in a really subtle, clever, masterful way. And Cersei cannot compete with that. So this is how Cersei responds, is through a show of dominance and through a very dark bludgeoning of her enemies of whom Marjorie is one. She did not consider though, because she's so disconnected from the reality of the event, she did not consider the ramifications of decimating so many big political players, uh, big members of, of, of important houses. She did not consider the ramifications of this. And in not considering those, this is a clear example of how the goal is to regulate herself, to best her enemies, to, to have that winning mentality of beating her enemies. I've won, I've won. There's the most incredible shot. After the sept has been blown up, uh, we zoom in on uh, Lena Headey and Cersei is just, there is that satisfying, it's almost like a burden has been lifted. There is a, really satisfying sigh that she um that she that she does to the camera and that encapsulates the feeling the feeling of empowerment she has destroyed her enemies and she feels empowered she feels she is reclaiming her autonomy and this again stems from her childhood trauma this stems from all of her traumatic experiences uh, and the psychological pattern of wanting to feel invulnerable, of wanting to feel empowered, is an addiction. Abusing others and destroying others is an addiction for her. The final point that I want to touch on is her treatment of death with Jamie. So Jamie and her die together. And in this moment, she regresses massively she becomes vulnerable and she becomes almost childlike she is imploring jamie she's like i don't want to die i don't want to die i don't want a baby to die so this reveals the origin point of her vulnerability in her narcissism this is almost a cyclical this is coming full circle this is very cyclical um she begins with the vulnerability of um of being a child and when she dies with jamie there is there is that um there is the resurgence of that vulnerability. And that is certainly where her narcissism stems from, is that feeling of anxiety, those weak points that she looks to suppress and that she looks to eradicate from herself. But it's only temporary. These feelings, these satisfying moments of gratification are temporary. When she quashes her enemies, it's temporary. So she needs to get the next fix. And the next fix, <laughs> doesn't quite matter who's there, she will find the next fix. It is an addiction and it is a way for her to feel satisfied and for her to uh, come, ba come back to her baseline of feeling empowered. Thank you so much for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I loved researching it and exploring it and putting it together. I found Cersei's psychology so complex and so there were so many aspects to it. Um, it was somewhat overwhelming at first. Uh, 
I do feel that that is the absolute nub of her psychological pattern though and that is to uh, gratify herself and to satisfy herself uh, through establishing dominance over others to quash that feeling of vulnerability to suppress that feeling of vulnerability because she doesn't know how to manage it she does not know how to manage uh, her traumas her childhood traumas that she's experienced thank you so much for watching this tatty bye